If you saw a pink fluffy thing on Mars, how would you know it was alive or not? So let's get into it. With no further ado, Kate, I'm going to turn to you first and ask you, um, is it possible that the origin of life will forever remain a mystery, or do we think that scientists will actually be able to find a final theory? You have three minutes. Um, so these are not mutually exclusive questions. Um, I think the specific origin of terrestrial life will remain a mystery because until we invent a time capsule, we will not be able to say exactly how it happened to give rise to our biological life. But it also will not be a mystery because we are already very close to getting a probable scenarios, in fact, many probable scenarios for the origin of life under the conditions that happen on the probiotic Earth. So we will be able to say that's how life can start and we'll have many scenarios for that and we'll be able to experimentally show that under specific probiotic conditions, that's how you make a living cell. Um, we will never be able to say one of those scenarios is the exact one that the life followed on Earth for the lack of evidence. But we'll be able to say this is how you take the soup of organic molecules and put it together and life comes out and it can come out to look like our life or it can come out to look at many other possible types of life um, that could happen on Earth or elsewhere in a solar system or outside. So yeah, I think the, that's not a very satisfying answer because I know I should probably say yes or no, but um, yeah, to me, those questions are not mutually exclusive. Fascinating. Okay, Adi, where do you stand on this? Well, I agree uh, uh, with Kate there that we will never know the historic process that took place because the historic record is gone. Uh, so that might sound, well, that's it, we'll never know. But the real question isn't the historic question. The real question is how could dead stuff become alive? What is the process that converted, was able to transform non-living into living, and we don't understand that properly. And what that is saying, something that, you know, when you go to university and you study uh, the, the natural sciences, they don't tell you this, but physics and biology are fundamentally incompatible. They're in disagreement. Physics is based on the idea that uh, nature is objective, there are laws of nature. Things just operate according to those laws. And the, the essence of biology is that there is function and purpose in the universe. All of biology is understood in terms of those functions and purposes. Um, and how does function and purpose emerge from a universe with no function and no purpose, ostensibly according to the physical laws? So here we have a, a, what one might say, the elephant in the room. How do we merge? Not, how, not just do we explain this problem, but how do we bring about the merging of physics and biology? Physics and chemistry about a century ago merged nicely. It's a continuum. And biology is this odd man out that doesn't fit in with, with the physical science view of nature. So. Uh, we seem to be stuck there, but there is, uh, well, light, uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. We're beginning to see new, a new kind of process in chemistry, new dimension of chemical possibility that was just really discovered something 10, 12 years ago that is giving us some hints about how that could have come about, and maybe we'll say something more about that subsequently. Sure we will. Fascinating. Also, I enjoyed being called the odd man out in, uh, in, in, of science there. That was, that was fun. <laughs> um, Chrysantha, what, what about you? What's your position on this matter? I think there's two kinds of mystery. One, one is like historical, empirical mysteries, like who killed JFK? We might never know that. But then there are sort of mysteries that can arise due to, to paradoxes, such as why is there a finite number of primes, or why do triangles have two sides? These will always remain a mystery because they're wrong. Um, and so th there seems to be no fundamental um, scientific or logical reason why we can't come up with an explanation for the origin of life. Um, I'm more interested in really uh, life as it could be. Like I always like to ask myself how life would be on other planets. If you saw a pink fluffy thing on Mars, how would you know it was alive or not? Um, is, you know, I, I like to ask myself about things on other planets, like, you know, um, 
what would art be in, in alien species or cutlery? Um, so anyway, it's, uh, I think if we ask ourselves that question, what we need is a definition of life. And I think uh, we have a good definition from Tibor Ganti in the 70s in Hungary that life is a, a system which has a boundary, a metabolism, and an informational control system. So cells are alive. They have these three things. I'm alive. I have a separate boundary, metabolism, and informational control system that exists at the level above cells. And in this sense, a country is alive because it has a boundary, a metabolism, and an informational control system too. So there's some process which appears to construct this hierarchical set of living things. And um, that's what I'm interested in. So how can such a process uh, consisting of this MBT, metabolism, boundary, and template, template is uh, like DNA, is the informational control system of the cell, how can those three things come about? And answering that question is to answer the origin of life. And I'll talk about, um, there's like three ways you could form them and then, uh, Anyway, I'll talk about how those things have come about. I don't think it's as great a mystery as, as you seem to suggest. I think we pretty much know um, a plausible route to it. Uh, and that's really about the origin of natural selection. The, the only algorithm we know, which an algorithm is something that has multiple implementations, an algorithm, the only algorithm we know that could arise spontaneously that can produce open-ended complexity. So really, what we need to answer is, how could evolution by natural selection first come about? And I hope we can answer that today. Mm, okay, as ever, the question has been thrown out by all the panelists, um, and we go from there. Um, I enjoyed the fact that you defined life there as having um, a boundary, a metabolism, and a sort of control center. Can I first ask, do we all agree that that's a, a definition of what life is? Excellent. Um, let's, let's go. Uh, Kate, crack on. What, what are your thoughts? I don't like that definition because um, I'm a practical experimentalist, so I need a definition that will help to tell me whether my dead molecules become alive, and that definition doesn't help with that because I can have undeniably dead systems as you know, country, for example, or as a set of chemical reactions that's undeniably dead. You look at it and you agree it's dead, and yet it can fit that definition. So I don't like that definition, but I also don't have a good counter definition because I don't have a good definition. Well, uh, the definition would say that your, de uh, your molecules are not alive. Um, so it would say that basically, um, unless there's a, like a virus is uh, not alive according to this definition, and neither are um, independent self-replicating templates. I mean, definitions can never be true or false. They can only be useful or not useful. This definition uh, is helpful to uh, chemists who are trying to produce life bottom up, uh, not top down like you're doing. Um, so what they need is a system that can implement natural selection in order to allow uh, the very noisy kinds of heredity that take place when you have chemical networks, which are um, always producing lots of things that can kill you, uh, to um, not kill everybody. So like in Stanislav Lem's Solaris, uh, there's no cells. The whole planet is meant to be alive. Problem there is that if you have one kind of error, like a, a nasty autocatalytic molecule that turns everything into tar, uh, that will kill the whole planet. The reason you need a boundary is that basically, uh, that, so that an individual that goes wrong doesn't kill the whole of society. So, so this is really uh, an important um, requirement. People have tried it on surfaces and other stuff. But that's really the poor man's compartment. A compartment, a soap bubble, gives you a lot uh, of stuff. Adi, I saw you shaking your head. Well, I'm pleased to be able to disagree with you. Uh, um, to be able to define life properly, we have to understand what it is. And to think of it as putting several things together, and then you will have life, I think, misses its essential uh, essence. Life is an excited and energized state. Uh, have you all noticed that it's very easy to take something that's alive and to kill it, but to take the components of life and get it back into that energized state is another problem, and we mm. still don't really know how to do it. So uh, it basically comes down to this, that in order to really understand, to be able to define something, you have to understand what it is since we're still struggling to understand the physical chemistry of 
living systems and how that process could have started from its beginnings, uh, it's clear that earliest life wouldn't have had a membrane. That's too sophisticated to, to, for, it to, uh, for that to come about from the first stage. You have to start out more simply and maybe in subsequent uh, questions we can talk about what could have happened there at the beginning, but I'll leave that for now. I, I can tell you're not happy. The problem with what you said is that this excited state, fire is an excited state. It's not alive. The reason fire doesn't get better and hasn't got better over the last three and a half billion years is because it doesn't have a mechanism for heredity. It doesn't have a mechanism for improving itself. This free radical reaction you know, does everything uh, uh, that you want. Uh, it grows exponentially and so forth, but it doesn't have the capacity for variation. That is, there aren't different kinds of it. And heredity, that is, different kinds of it don't give rise to kinds of it that are similar to the parent. So you've got to have these um, properties of natural selection uh, for open-ended adaptation to take place. I agree with you that you need this um, out of equilibrium system. Absolutely, that's right. But on top of that, you need more. You need uh, to turn fire into something that can be uh, show heredity. And actually, the, the, the boundary is the easiest thing to produce of the, of the metabolism and the template. So the boundary, you know, you just, you know, you have soap in a sink, you shake it, it makes two bubbles, roughly speaking. That's, you know, that's pretty much the easiest thing to grow and divide. And in fact, experimentalists have made uh, liposomes, all kinds of things, coacervates now, all kinds of different micelles and stuff. And many mechanisms have been found that um, allow these things to replicate. So really, I, uh, uh, we have to accept that um, you know, compartments are the easiest thing to make. Fascinating. I love the fact that we're here to talk about the origin of life. And we can't even talk about the origin yet because we disagree about what is life. <laughs> uh, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.